Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, let's go ahead and, and call the September 7th, 2023 meeting of the Historic Preservation Commission to order. Can we have the roll, please? Yes. Chairman Lane. Here. Commissioner Sibley. Here. Commissioner Fenster. Here. Commissioner Gayu. Here. Commissioner Jacoby. Here. Commissioner Barnard. Here. Council Member Rodriguez. Here. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, next, we would have the approval from our August 3rd meeting, the approval of the minutes. Do any commissioners have any comments or corrections for those minutes? And if none, I'd entertain a motion. I've got a move. Uh, how about a, I've got, uh, <coughs> there you go, thank you. So we've got moved from Commissioner Fenster, seconded by Commissioner Jacoby. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? None. So motions are, uh, sorry, the meeting minutes are approved. Uh, report from the chair. I don't have anything in particular to talk about this evening. Uh, so I'll cede my time to HPC st staff liaison. Well, I have a slew of things on my report. Excellent. <laughs> um, so first and foremost, the um, certificate of appropriateness for window replacement at 545 Collier Street that um, you considered and denied at the July 6th meeting um, was appealed to city council and that appeal hearing was held this Tuesday. So they ended up remanding it back to the commission. So it will be um, on the October uh, agenda, so October 5th, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, they have also directed the commission to consider a certificate of hardship. So I'm working with the applicant to um, get that information, you know, get what we need from her as far as, you know, um, getting her to explain how she meets the criteria for that. So um, that will be coming to you at the October meeting. Um, the other thing kind of similar, similarly related to that, um, there was some discussion about um, the neighboring property at 601 Collier regarding whether or not their windows were original or double paned and had been replaced. So I did some research on that in the file. Um, it was, there wasn't much to find except there was a certificate of appropriateness issued in 2008 for window replacement at that building, at that particular house. Um, it appeared to have been approved administratively because I could not find any discussion of it in the minutes. So, um, and, I, and I could not find, there was not a building permit in the file. I did, could not find anything in our online system. So it could be that window replacement may not have required a permit at that time. I'm not sure. I know at some point, um, you know, the IBC didn't necessarily require, require that. So that could have been the case. So it's a bit of a mystery, but um, long story short, it happened 15 years ago. We have different policies and standards at this point. So um, that is the update on that. Um, so the next item is um, the Tower of Compassion survey. Um, Carl McWilliams is starting that. We have a purchase order for his services. So he anticipates sometime probably October or November-ish, he should have that completed. Um, so once that is completed, we'll bring it to the commission to review and determine um, if that's something, if, if landmarking that, doing a landmark application for that is something we want to proceed with. His initial thought is that it probably does meet the standards for National Register listing as well. Um, so stay tuned on that. Um, on the survey plan, I'm kind of at a stone wall with our consultant that we were working, you know, our general consultant we were working with or trying to work with to get a, a proposal. So that, um, you know, we may have to RFP that one after all, but um, Glenn and I are gonna continue talking about that and see if we can't get some additional information. So we are attempting to proceed with that. So um, the only other thing I have is that the Dickens Barn and some of the adjacent lands the dedication agreement is going to city council on September 12th, so this next Tuesday. Um, it is on the consent agenda as a resolution, so um, I don't, you know, hopefully won't need to do a presentation, but um, if I do, I'll be there. 
Um, so effect, essentially the dedication will be conditioned on approval and acceptance of the final plat. So we are still working out some details with the final plat for the applicant, um, but that, that is moving forward as well. So, and that is my update. Did I miss anything, Glenn or Jeremy? All right. <laughs> okay. Um, I have one quick question for you and then I'll open up to commissioners. Uh, on that appeal, um, I assume that there's a video of the of that hearing and would there be draft minutes published prior of the city council's meeting published prior to our uh, HBC meeting? Um, no? That is a good question. I don't know about the timing. I would hope that they would be available, but I can't make any promises. Um, I, there is, there should be a recording of that particular hearing on the city's YouTube channel. So which, which would be live now. I mean, available. It, it should now, it should right? be up for yeah. it should be up now for streaming. So that would be that mm -hmm. is available. So you can review the discussion and and such as well. Great. All right. Thank you, uh, commissioners. Any questions for staff on anything? Oh, hold on, I've got uh, okay. <coughs> Commissioner Guyer here first. Do you have um, a copy or the form? That yeah, you, I, I got the wrong one. Well, all right, sorry. That's my fault. Uh, um, do you have a copy or template for this certificate of hardship of what that would entail? So we have the section of the code, which is uh, 2.56.10. I'm sorry, 2.56.160 which does have some criteria for certificate of hardship um, based on our, much, much like the appeal of the certificate of appropriateness, this is something of uncharted territory for, for this commission as well. So um, we will be following the criteria established within, within the uh, historic preservation section of the municipal code. Okay, uh, Commissioner Barnett. You had, uh, I know we've asked this question before and <coughs> you've answered it. I just don't remember the answers. On the plat uh, that has to be approved, do we have a role in that or is that just done administratively on the Dickens it. part? At this point, it's administrative. Okay. So. Uh, I'm going to have one more question on the appeal. I know the city's attorney's office loves hanging out in HPC uh, once a month. Would Are they planning on being here for this appeal hearing or not necessarily? So technically, it's a remanding and reconsideration rather than okay. an appeal. Okay. So it's, yeah, I'll let Jeremy expand on that. Yes, good evening, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Um, so our kind of logic, as Jennifer pointed out, is that it's being remanded for reconsideration of the Certificate of Appropriateness uh, for the board to consider, the commission to consider hardship issues and whether or not that might play a role in their decision. Uh, assuming it doesn't, um, we'd also consider the certificate of hardship at that point. Um, I'm going to work, be working with staff in advance on getting the staff report together, assuming everything is pretty straightforward. There's not really any questions. I, I'm not planning on being here next month, um, but if it does appear that we're going to have questions or if the commissioners have any questions after the packet's been posted or been published, I can make arrangements to be here. All right. Thank you. Any other commissioner questions for staff? No? All right. Thank you for that update. Oh, okay. Sorry. Right. Commissioner Barnard. Uh, Jeremy, just to clarify, I just want to understand the difference. You said that we're instructed to consider hard, that you're going to work on considering hardship and then also then the certificate of hardship. How do you distinguish those two? So, my understanding of the proce just procedurally speaking, the certificate of appropriateness was decided by the commission, then appealed to city council, and then city council remanded the issue of the certificate of appropriateness back to the commission. So I think we need to tie the loop about whether or not the commission wants to change its uh, decision based on the city council's guidance. Assuming the commission denies it again, or maintains its prior decision, we then switch gears and move to the certificate of hardship application that the um, applicant is uh, filing imminently. I mean, I was there, so uh, the motion I heard was that they, it was remanded and that, that we should consider hardship. My conclusion from that was that the applicant would fill out a certificate of hardship 
and that's how we would consider hardship. I don't know that we have any hardship guidelines that we can follow other than those in the city code with respect to certificate of hardship. So I was, I, I didn't understand when you expressed those as two different things. And Commissioner, I, I do believe we had to close the loop on the certificate of appropriateness still, because that was the issue remanded. It was a remand decision from city council and that was concerning the certificate of appropriateness. So I think we need to consider that. I understand your point and I agree with you that hardship is not a criteria. So I anticipate that the hardship aspect won't really play in a certificate of appropriateness. But assuming the certificate of appropriateness is denied, again by the commission, we would then go to certificate of hardship issue. Again, the, the motion as I heard it was, it was remanded not just for reconsideration, but for reconsideration based on hardship. So I don't think there's two issues here. I don't think, I don't think we're supposed to have any kind of a motion to reconsider, period, full stop. I think we're instructed to reconsider based on hardship, full stop. I understand what you're saying, Commissioner. I've provided my advice to the Commission. Okay, well, it, we, we have the person who made the motions here, or we can go back and listen to it, but I took, I was, you know, I took pretty good notes. So uh, would you expect that that would all happen in the same evening? It would be just a one after another agenda item sort of scenario? Yes, yeah, Mr. Okay. Chairman. All right, thank you. That helps. Okay. <clears throat> Great. Thanks for that information. Um, let's see. We will move on to public invited to be heard. Oh, all right. I, okay. Um, all right. Uh, I, Commissioner I'm, Jacoby. I'm a little confused on the, the direction from council because if it's coming back to us to reconsider the appropriateness, I don't see that anything's changed other than perhaps consideration of financial uh, constraints. Uh, so I, I guess we can we can rubber stamp what we thought before, um, if unless uh, commissioners' minds have changed. And and to that point, I I'd be happy to have any. And all commissioners come to my house and see interior storm windows. I have three different kinds, as I said, and uh, the data says financially it is much cheaper than replacing windows. And uh, functionally, it is very comparable to double pane windows. So again, I don't even see how there's gonna be a standing for the applicant on a financial basis, but be that as it may, we will go through the motions. Um, but I'm, I'm very happy if any of the commissioners are interested in seeing interior storm windows, I'll be glad to show them interior storm windows that I made personally very cheaply, some that I bought uh, through a commercial uh, group that installed them for me, and a separate uh, kind of storm window that I made from a kit that I bought at Budget Home Center. So we could have Storm Window 101 at my house if you'd like. Just not all at one time because that would be a meeting of the Historic Preservation Commission. Uh, um, yes. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I would suggest that all the commissioners go back, review whatever information you uh, would like to review prior, re obviously review the packet and we'll walk through the procedures as outlined for us at next meeting. To the, to the chair, if I may just uh, mm -hmm. jump in to add one more thing. Um, and follow up on, on Jeremy's comments. It's important, one thing that's important to note is the, the council neither approved nor denied, they, ne they neither approved nor denied the appeal. So basically there was no action, positive or negative, to, taken on the appeal of the certificate of appropriateness. So that remanding, so basically that, that question is still open. So that's something that we, they, they directed us to go back and reconsider. So we would need to, as Jeremy said, reconsider the certificate of appropriateness and then move into the certificate of hardship, so. Okay, thanks, yeah. Uh, uh, okay, I, I'll, I'll give you the time, but I, I don't wanna spend all day hashing out whether or not we're supposed to do this or that, because the procedures are outlined for us and we're gonna get there. I, so, I, and I don't know that as a commission we have any power to change the way the city sets up their processes. So I don't wanna bog this meeting down in that discussion, but, I, but again, I'm gonna cede you the time here 
uh, for comment. And I won't take long. I just want to. I will. I will. I object to the way that the city attorney has presented this. I don't think it's accurate, and I and I think we should have some way between now and then of having some maybe watching this on and, and see what they said. But I don't think there is any need for us to simply restate what we said before. I that is. I was there. That's not what happened at the meeting. We are not asked to review our decision on COA, period. That's not what happened. What happened was we were asked to review it on the basis of hardship. I have no position with respect to hardship. If I'm going to listen to the facts as they're presented, if the, if the person the person seeking to do this wants to come before us and present us to it, I'll listen to it at that time and I'll make my decision then. But I just, I just want to make sure there's only, I, th I, I'm very, I want to be very clear that there's only one item on the, that, that can be on the agenda right now. If we don't want to consider that, then the city council can take up the appeal, or they, we can write them back and say, well, we considered it on the basis of hardship, and we have, we don't agree, um, and that we don't have to then make any decision other than the fact that we did that. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Fenster. Yes, are, are we uh, competent to hear a hardship matter? Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. City Attorney, yeah. Yes, it, it's empowered to the Historic Preservation Commission under the Certificate of Hardship. Uh, Not Certificate of Appropriateness, but Certificate of Hardship. hardship. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay, uh, we'll move on now to public invited to be heard. Um, uh, we have a short list here, and if there are others uh, following that that are, would like to speak, we, we can uh, uh, come up after this. Uh, please uh, come up as I call you. You've got uh, three minutes to speak. Please state your name before you begin your comments. Uh, first speaker would be Sarah Levinson. Thank you. Um, I, uh, Sarah Levison, I live in the HE Booth House um, in the historic East Side neighborhood on Emory Street. Um, a couple of requests. Um, I did watch with a lot of interest the HPC meeting um, of August 3rd, um, specifically because you had the demolition ordinance on the agenda. I was really surprised to see not just the demolition ordinance, but staff bring an entire slew of other ordinance that was very important that the, the, the commission had a huge discussion on that was not on the agenda. Anything that you do that's not on the agenda is bad form for, for governmental uh, transparency. So I would recommend that if you're going to do that, please, commissioner, stop staff from going through those discussions because there was no presentation in the packet on this and all these other you know discussion points um, were not um, given proper public notice. So please stop them from doing this again. Um, I would also like to point out that I um, tried to find a staff um, uh, presentation on the new business item 8C um, to modify the land development code. Um, there was nothing. You have 87 pages. What was published on the um, public records portal had nothing on item 8C. So I implore you not to take up 8C because how could any of us comment or read it when there was nothing for us to review? And I don't know if you guys got something to review. A um, couple of other points. Um, I would also um, like to point out that when you're considering the demolition ordinance, that you also add another word to um, historic. That would be cultural. And the reason I'm proposing that is, number one, the Tower of Compassion that you're going to consider that you're studying right now may not necessarily be historic, but it certainly is a cultural resource for the city. 
Um, I can also imagine, and you guys don't read the, um, the land grant statement, but it, um, the land grant statement that city council and many other bodies um, read also calls to the attention that we may have um, ancient artifacts and land and resources that are Native American resources. And so when you say historic, could be prehistory, it could be other cultural resources, but again, if somebody takes down a, a massive pile of dirt and you and there is a, res a cultural resource there, um, nothing in the demolition code would cover a circumstance like that. So I would recommend adding cultural in with historic. Um, a couple of other comments. Um, one of the other uh, things that I found um, uh, very disturbing uh, in last month's discussion was. I, I'd ask you to wrap up. Okay, fine, if you sorry. Can very quickly. Um, uh, that the numbers to the requirements to essentially uh, initiate something from a historic uh, district or conservation district was raised so unreasonably high that it doesn't really meet with what the city's charter says for referendum and initiatives, which is. 10% of voters, um, or uh, what the state constitution says, which is 25% um, to do things such as recalling elected officials. Um, one other thing about the demolition ordinance that I don't understand is, is that a quasi-judicial matter? So I, that wasn't clear from what I read. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is uh, Sharon O'Leary. You start the clock. Mm -hmm. Could you please talk into the microphone? Notice that when I stand next to the microphone, you can kind of hear me, but anyone who has hearing problems, if you're sitting further back, they don't get the full bountiful beauty of your voice. But more importantly, they don't get the information. And um, attorney, you're, the, you're also guilty of that. Your microphone is like pointing at you, but it still comes out. Okay. Not, not doing the purpose it's Thanks. designed to do, okay? I just want to create understanding. Thank you. First of all, I want to thank you guys for working on the demolition code. Woohoo! Um, I just want you to think about three things. As you're looking at this code, I want you to make sure that its appropriate reviews take place with appropriate reasoning. Also, that adequate and appropriate notice is given to interested parties. We were left out on that. Appropriate, and the last thing is appropriately, appropriate penalties are fine. It has to be hurt, hurt the bottom line enough so people follow the rules. Okay, if it hits them in their pocketbook, they're gonna consider playing by the rules of the game. 830 Emory Street was demoed because the home could not support a second floor. Well, not many homes in our historic neighborhood could meet that requirement or have the existing foundation that could do it, and thus it could be demoed to put on a second floor. I would say that is not appropriate. Um, I also ask that you stay focused and don't get distracted by other things staff brings to you during your meeting. That's why it's important to make motions, get a second, have a full discussion, and vote. And a winning vote directs staff and then you guys can stay on the course. As far as um, last month's meeting, why the change from 25% um, to 51% for historic districts? There's only a limited number of possible neighborhoods that could even meet that criteria. So um, not many people are gonna apply for it. Do you think downtown would have qualified for a historic district with 51%? No, but with 25% they did. And we benefit from it. We benefit from grants and monies that are available. Presently, we only have three districts. What are we afraid of? Mid-century architecture? Is it on the horizon? Um, last, I want you to update the designated landmark page. And then again, the architectural survey page still has not been updated. This has been going on for months now. Uh, it was what was it, an accessibility issue? It's still not up there. We have three districts that a lot of time, money, effort, state and local monies is still not up there. And it says, contact Jennifer if you have questions or problems. I'm sorry, I think Jennifer is overburdened already and it will be very low on her list if, if 
all of a sudden I tell everyone, okay, if you want the information, contact Jennifer. She doesn't have the time. She's a busy woman trying to do her job. So let's just see if we can um, move things along and keep our community informed. I greatly appreciate everything you do. I know you got on this board because of an interest, desire, or passion. And right now, the city boards are, are all open with vacancies, and I think it's great. I think um, it's uh, we the citizens of Longmont, not the staff of Longmont. We the citizens of Longmont are the game changers and the guiding lights. So again, I appreciate you. Thank you. We had a couple extra seconds because I couldn't figure out how to get started. All right. <laughs> Uh, anyone else in the audience that would like to, uh, please please come forward. State your name. I am Terry Goon, and I live in the East Side Historic um, neighborhood in Longmont. And I'm calling. I'm, I'm I'm here tonight because I I read through the new codes that you you guys are going to be discussing tonight, and it, the feeling of it when you're when you're reading these codes, it's as if you own the properties. People are, um, I guess they have your blessing to live there until you decide that they no longer are keeping up with the property maintenance that you are, are required of them, requiring of them. And as a, as a person who has not had a, a ton of income my whole life and living in a historic home, that it really bothers me, the tone of your demolition by neglect um, code stuff that you've got written there. It's, it is... Basically, a, you're taking over people's private property, or you the potential is there to take over people's private property. Now, sure, you've got all these forms you can fill out. You can go before the board. You can, you, know, you can make certain that your neighbors aren't signing things against you. You can file for hardships. You can do all these things. Well, my neighbors and I are we're simple people, and we live in simple homes. And sometimes these aren't the things that. Um, it's not as if we own our home when you guys are forcing this kind of thing down our throat. And I, I just, I want you to appreciate how it comes across because it, it comes across horribly. It comes across as if we are, um, you know, lucky that you're allowing us to live in our homes up until the point where we just don't, you know, take care of the paint job or the foundation or whatever it is that you determine is so important that we keep track of and, and place our priorities on. So it's this, as if our priorities, your priorities supersede whatever our priorities are. I, I, you know, if you've got a designated home, that makes sense to me. You, you've bought this designated home, but so many are not designated. And, and your code was talking a lot about uh, designating homes without uh, owner consent. So that's, that to me is a, I struggle with that and I struggle with how it's all worded. So thank you. Thank you for being on the board though. Thank you. Anyone else uh, would like to speak? No, seeing none, I will close the public hearing. Thank you for your comments. All right, uh, let's see. New business uh, review of the demolition code amendments from last meeting. Actually, this is not new business. This is it's continuing really kind of both, business. Yeah, it's sort of prior, <laughs> it is really sort of prior business. Right, but, but we got okay. um, through most of the changes. Um, we uh, had a few stops, and I think uh, the commission wanted us to do a little bit more work in a couple of areas. So um, one has to do with the big one is the penalty. Oops, Oops. sorry, I forgot the. Sh that's I'm my done. bad. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> that's my bad. I, I didn't. I should have practiced <laughs> a little bit more. You only had thirty seconds to make that presentation. <laughs> Uh, one was the, the big one was penalty for um, uh, that we talked about for a permit moratorium. Um, we also uh, provided another option um, that uh, Jeremy did some research and uh, we can go through that. We did find with our appeal that we had some snafu, we had a snafu in the existing code that um, we corrected. So that's something that uh, we'll talk about um, tonight that you have not seen on August 3rd. And then um, 
Jeremy added some language clarifying what's a quasi-judicial decision of yours and what is not. Um, that was added as well. So um, we'll go ahead and, and run through that. I guess hopefully we have um, a consensus that you would recommend this to the city council. If so, um, we're recommending that you approve um, our first uh, motion, which is adopt the proposed ordinance uh, changes as shown, or an option would be with the following changes. So if you have a few small changes, we can certainly outline those and then uh, incorporate that into the recommendation to city council. Or you could say, we don't like any of it, we're not gonna recommend approval of it. So if you have any questions, uh, uh, I'll be happy to answer them or we can start the process. Okay. Um, unless there are any broad general sweeping questions, I'd like to just go through it in big chunks. Um, Maybe, you know, our first section is uh, definitions. We've got the, the definition of demolition, some changes to definitions of historic properties. Um, if we could, if, if there, are there any questions or changes or comments on the definition section from any of the commissioners? Seeing none. Mr. Chair, uh, yeah. what I might add is we actually highlighted the sections that are new. Now, um, uh, Commissioner Gayu wasn't here last time, so if you want to walk through them all, that certainly makes sense. But Yeah, I was hoping to j just run through each section just because, yeah, for that reason okay. and just because I want to make sure that once we say we're, this is recommend, you know, that we're going to, if there's an approval here tonight or recommendation of approval that everybody remembers what we're talking about. Um, so, um, following the, the definition section, the next chunk that was, that had a significant, uh, change was just the criteria for designation. Um, a lot of that was wordsmithing and rearranging. So we're talking about, uh, 2.56.050. So seeing nothing there, let's jump to 2.56.070, which does include some changes from last meeting. It's the wheel. Yeah, it's the wheel. So 2.56.070. Okay, yeah, I'm just, I was just waiting for Glenn to get it up <laughs> on the screen for everyone. There's a lot we didn't change here. I know, sorry. There we go. Okay. okay. All right, Commissioner Jacoby. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Um, on, let's see, 256070A5, it still says 75%, whereas on the next page it says, uh, well, it says 51, then it's crossed off and it says 30% now uh, down there for the percent of properties. Uh, for the, oh, that's the petition. It says 51% on the next page for the application requirements, but it says an A, Five it still says 75%. And so that probably should be changed to 51% as well, since that's referring to the same uh, application, um, unless we decide with comment from folks in town that it, we lower it further again. But uh, 75 is uh, probably 
uh, needs to be updated. And then I had another thought about D, the, the yellowed out section. Um, it says uh, that design guidelines should be consistent with the Secretary of Interior standards for treatment of historic properties required for all districts. Um, and then it says it shall be developed by the applicant and owners of the properties within the proposed district with the assistance of staff. Um, I don't know if we want to hold every building within a proposed historic district consistent to the interior standards. Um, certainly there are outlier buildings in most neighborhoods that become historic districts. Um, I was thinking maybe it should say something a little softer like, um, you know, shall be developed by the applicant and owners using the Secretary of Interior Standards, uh, of, of Interior Standards as guidelines or something a little softer that would be more negotiable uh, should some neighborhood pursue a historic district. Yeah. Right, thanks. Um, I, I just, I can give you the history behind why it says that because that's what the, the Secretary of Standards are the interior, those standards are our Bible. That's what right. everything is judged against. And so if there were to be a district that adopted standards that weren't in compliance with the Secretary of Interior standards, that would muddle, significantly muddle the waters in terms of any kind of review of this body. Right, that's a foundational document. Right, that would... And if, if somebody wants to exceed that, they could, but sure. but to erode that would be seemingly not wise. That was the. Th I'm just trying to make this usable document. Again, we have codes that sound high and mighty, and we can talk about the conservation overlay later. Um, but reducing the percentage of people so that we could have applications, and making it a little more flexible. Certainly. If we are gonna have a house as a city landmark, we can hold to the, the Secretary of Interior standards. If we are gonna make a national historic district, we hold to the Secretary of Interior standards. If we decide to make a city historic district, which we've never done, if we wanna make it approachable and usable, maybe we should make the, the requirements a little more flexible and maybe we could get some buy-in and we could actually use this. That's all I was thinking. Okay, thanks. I think it might be at, at the very least worth uh, the discussion of percentages. Um, so maybe if we can focus in on that just for the moment, I'd like to get uh, any opinions from commissioners as to whether 51% is the number, whether it ought to be less. We, we've obviously knocked it down from 75 to 50, so I think that's a fair point in terms of whether that's, um, uh, Mr. Anyway, Chair, I'm, I'm, yes. I'm sorry, the, that paragraph F is specifically to the design guidelines. So maybe they should be the same. Um, but the first one is you have to have a petition of 75% of the owners agreeing to the district that F is to those design guidelines that are like you're saying, going over and above. Sharon, please. Yes. Well, it's, yeah, you really can't just talk in the middle of the meeting because it just it interrupts our process. So it's here. Okay. So planning director, Nim Wigan. You've, so you've <laughs> clarified Perfect. that. Thanks. That, uh, We've, the the fifty one percent is in some refers back to this D. Uh, what what I'm regardless of these particular pieces, what I wanna what I wanna focus on so that we're not here all night is the percentage of property uh, percentage of owners um, that must consent to the district. So we're gonna start up at twenty six five oh seven oh introductory paragraph note seventy five percent. And then it's repeated in that same section A5, percentage of owners. So uh, I'm uh, Commissioner Jacoby. I think my philosophy is pretty clear. I think this code should be made usable, not just look 
lovely but not be usable. Um, we haven't, uh, I mean, with the code existing the way it is with a 25%, you haven't had crowds ba banging down your doors applying. I don't see why we have to make the hurdle larger. Um, I would be happy to keep it at 25% personally. Okay, thank you. Any other commissioners care to comment on that? Right. Commissioner Gayu? Yeah, I mean, I understand the 51%. I mean, we live in a democracy, and if we're not going to have every single thing appealed, you know, I think it's helpful for us to be able to say that the majority of people that responded are in, you know, accord with putting, you know, a, a district which will have some, uh, you know, requirements of the people that are within that district. So 51% makes sense to me. I mean, it is, yeah, we have... We've had zero traction on historic districts <laughs> since they were allowed, but I feel like if we if we drop it back down to 25, we're sort of setting ourselves back up for you know a lot of appeals. So. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Fenster. I agree. Can you clarify just exactly which, that you agree <laughs> with what percentage, <laughs> please? Just so we're clear. <clears throat> 51. Thank you. <laughs> Any other commissioner comments? Okay. Um, I'm going to note that <clears throat> um, and move on. So the, um, the, the section D here uh, that's highlighted, this has been changed. Um, can, and can we just get a clarification on what exactly changed from last meeting? Sure. So I think there was some confusion of uh, how it read, and I think someone specifically wanted to change appearance to integrity of the building. Um, and then we combined a couple of sentences, basically, um, so that um, it now states design guidelines consistent with the Secretary of Interior standards for the treatment of historic properties shall be required for all districts and shall be developed by the applicant <clears throat> and owners of properties within the proposed district. So anything underlined was added, anything struck out was struck out. Okay, thank you. Uh, we've heard from Commissioner Jacoby. Any other commissioners have comments specific to this section? Uh, Commissioner Barner. I'm looking for some guidance on the word integrity. Uh, I mean, I know what, it, what we're expected to have integrity. Um, I know what it means to keep something whole and undivided is integrity. Um, those are the dictionary definitions I found. I'm trying to see what this would mean. Um, I'm going to uh, just to, in order for flow, I'm going to skip over Commissioner Gayu and jump to Commissioner Fenster because this was his um, request. And then I'll come back to you. So, Commissioner Fenster, if you, I believe your, your, your suggestion was to change this to integrity. Uh, yes. Uh, can you, am I on? Oh, you, okay. Uh, I intended that integrity in this context uh, refer to uh, architectural in integrity, that is, design integrity, uh, that is giving credence to periods of architectural design. <clears throat> Thank you. Commissioner Gayu. Um, sure. I mean, I can expound upon the integrity issue in that when you have uh, a property designated, generally speaking, that designation speaks to the property's integrity to either its period of construction or to its period of significance, when, which may or may not be architectural. So it may be that something important happened in that place, and so you want to maintain the appearance of that property in accord with the time period of that important um, event. So in historic preservation, generally, that's what we're talking about when we're talking about integrity of maintaining that aspect. Um, my comment was going to be that generally 
design guidelines are, are not something that sort of the general populace does. I think that's a stretch to ask an applicant and um, you know property owners to do that. They should certainly be part of the process, but typically it's sort of a professional thing that's done. So that's my comment on that. Thank you. Any other comments on this section? Okay, we're gonna. We'll, I'll come. We'll come back to everything here in one big swoop. At least the, the items that were up for grabs. But I want to go through various pieces. All right. So if we roll down a little bit, uh, F has a highlighted section that just included the fifty-one percent of the property owners. Um, in regards to draft guidelines, I'm going to lump that in with the same percentage conversation. So are there any other comments on this general section before we roll? No. Okay. All right. So then I'm going to roll all the way down because we don't have a lot of changes for a while here. Okay, we're going to come all the way down to uh, 2.56180. It's page 54 of the packet. Two five six one eighty, page fifty four. Okay, so the first set of chunks here, A, B, and C, we discussed uh, last uh, month, and there have been no changes. Um, there are changes um, to D and E. And I believe that it, in D it was just clarifying uh, that the appointed person is the chair or the chair's designee from the commission. And then in E, can you... Uh, Maybe clarify for us what the, specifically the E change was. I believe this was something suggested by um, HPC that um, the, the wording was perhaps a bit clunky in E, so um, we just tried to clarify it. Yeah, so we've... Um, this is, this is the procedure by which a, uh, a, a, this um, application for demolition comes forward to the HPC. If someone says that should be, uh, this really should be a historic building, you shouldn't be able to demo it, it comes in front of the HPC, the HPC says, nope, it's, it doesn't qualify, so then the demolition can move forward. Is right. that that's correct? Okay. All right. All right. Uh, questions on this general section? I've got Commissioner Jacoby. Yes, I, I'm sorry, but I'd like to just back up a little bit to A two, um, uh, which uh, building areas would be uh, reviewed. Um, Outside the original city subdivision, I would suggest adding buildings older than 75 years because not all buildings have been part of a cultural resource survey and we may sneak something out that's, that's older and might be significant. It should at least be given a, a cursory review. So just adding buildings over 75 years old beyond the original city subdivision, I would suggest we throw that in there. I'm not sure I'm entirely clear. Well, basically, 
stretching the window another 25 years so within the 50 to 25 that wouldn't be wouldn't we, we, could qualify? Do it, we could do 50 also i'm thinking all right so this is 2023 we could go back look at all buildings demolished after 19 or before 1973 the odds it just seems to me the odds are low that we would not have on our radar a historic building a, a building that had historic events built in the 70s or the 60s but if you go back 75 years a lot of buildings might qualify simply on the basis of age and the period they were built and that would just add one more uh, stop point to say hey let's just double check this building before we demolish it which is why i was thinking 75 i realize it just adds another layer we could make it 50 but i i think we could save maybe staff and people a bit of time if we made it 75. 75, I think, would, would uh, be more practical. We, we do have 50 sort of scattered throughout the rest of this. We could, as we could do base. 50 to keep it yeah. simple. I'm, yeah. a, I'm fine right. with simple. We can <laughs> make it 50. But maybe we should add 50 years then for, and not delineate between the original city uh, and uh, city boundaries and outside the city. Any. But, any structure over 50 years. And that's what it does. So the, the, the very first sentence is prevent the loss of structures 50 years or, or older. So the first, the start is if it's 50 years or older, it be, it's potential. And then it has to filter through all of these other criteria after that. But if it's 50 years or older, but it isn't in a cultural resource survey, it might slip out, correct? Or am I reading this wrong? Uh... See, okay, I, I think right. they should I see what you mean. See uh, what I'm saying? Maybe we, so if we just skip this city's original city subdivision line and just say any structures over 50. Okay. Um, but if it's over 50, it's already going to be. No, if you're saying outside, any structure over 50, period. The, any building over 50, whether it's in the original city subdivision or it's outside the city subdivision. There are some buildings, I know there are some homesteads within the city limits outside the original city subdivision, and I've seen some, and I look around and say, oh, that's an interesting building, make a note of the address. I bet I could pick some that have not been surveyed that are very significant to the history of our city. And they could be demolished because they are old, some are not in great shape. I think they should be reviewed as well. Mr. Chair, um the discussion we had along this and, and the why you're pushing us to do a survey plan is that we catch those. So yes. that's our ultimate goal, that everything that is significant would have a cultural survey. Right, and that is correct as well. But until that's done, maybe we should have the 50-year catch point. I mean, I think the survey is, is very sorely needed, but... Again, it's not done yet. Okay, all right. Are there any, uh, yeah, let me get other commissioners' comments on this. Commissioner Fenster? I agree. <laughs> to who? You agree with me? Yep. Or? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I agree with the last speaker. <laughs> me. Any other commissioner comments about this? That's, that's commissioner Sibley? I'm going to do it too. Uh, I do agree. I, as we're talking about this, because that's the whole thing about you know getting the surveys and everything. That's great, and I'm hoping that we get those sooner than, than later. But in the meantime, that 50 years—that's a really good point, um, and that would catch a lot of things. Um, does that then start to overstep, though? You know, to what somebody was mentioning earlier, what Terry had mentioned about. You know, is that starting to be like, oh, it's a giant HOA over the entire city of Longmont? <laughs> so, um, so that would be my, again, something to discuss. So, yeah, that that is my concern uh, because if we did that, we would basically scrap one and two, and it would just say if it's fifty years or older, it's eligible. Which means anybody demoing any building that's 50 years or older in the entire city would then have to get reviewed. And I think there's a burden not only on potentially us, but more so on staff reviewing a, an awful lot of 
Yeah, and and I, I, I mean, we're, that's why we're pushing so hard to get these surveys and get some of these properties identified outside of that. Now, it, I, let, let me ask a question. If, is there any mechanism for staff to currently identify a property with any historic, that, that might have ex historic significance? You know, if, if, I mean, we just did it with the, Zlatan Barn, it, that wasn't on a map, and it it came up because of a, a broader um, development plan. But is there any any mechanism in place to catch a one off that might be floating around the city somewhere? Uh, to the chair, um, the primary tool and mechanism would be the county assessor um, data on when the building was built. If it were a if it's a straight up demolition permit. Otherwise, um, if there's a development proposal for a property, we will attempt to, you know, like I came in late in the process for this latent property, but I know there was a cultural resource survey that was required for that property. So as it, it really does kind of become a one-off thing as we receive development proposals that could impact potentially historic properties, but that is, um, you know, we have that discretion to ask for a cultural resources survey if we suspect that there's something significant about that property. But for straight demolitions, it's a little different. It's a little harder to do because we just don't have that. Inf we, we may not have that information beyond, you know, the built date on the assessor's website. I think this was a concern raised early about how much can you can control an undesignated property? which is what we're doing under this paragraph. So we felt there should be some guidelines. Now, um, we do have surveys that are outside the original um, city town site. So, but that doesn't mean we have everyone. And every building's getting older every day. So um, that's just a little bit of background. But there was concern about just saying everything 50 years old falls into this net. Commissioner Gayo? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, my primary push would be for obviously for us to survey the complete city so that we know that is the, that is the purpose of that so that then we don't have to have these discussions because to require, you know, review of every building that was built after 1973, that's what we're talking about, is going to be, you know, just a ridiculous burden on staff. And, and to, for our time, too, probably not very helpful in general. You know, you're going to pick up one or two in a year, maybe, but it's going to drown with everything else. So personally, I, I'm fine with the way it's written. I think we'll catch enough stuff and staff is, you know, aware enough that they are looking for us and they're sort of our eyes and ears behind the scenes. And yeah, I mean, even when we do review stuff, people still demolish things. So <laughs> unfortunately, uh, so I think this, this, pro this is probably a good medium effort. Yeah. Thank you. Commissioner Fenster. Uh, do It's red as go. Yep. Do do we know that it, that it would be a significant additional burden? In other words, to put a fence around the fifty years, uh, just a preliminary fence around fifty years, so that they are looked at a little more sharply, uh, so that we have the opportunity to pick out significant structures. Uh, I don't think this is a huge imposition and probably a good step in the direction of future preservation. All right, thank you. Okay, we'll loop back unless anybody has anything more to comment about that. Um, let's roll on to, we're gonna run all the way back down to the appeals section. So that's 2.56210. That is page 58. The first chunk of this, there's not a lot 
uh, of change, but there is uh, section D has been altered since last month. Getting my exercise is my <laughs> index finger. Okay, so um, we had an appeal last month, as you're aware of, um, and we rewrote the whole Land Development Code in 2018. And as you see, we reference back to the process for appeals, um, back to Chapter 15 of the Land Development Code. What was missed is kind of a key thing, is an appeal is not a public hearing. Um, so it doesn't require the same notice requirements. But the uh, section in the old 2.56, this section actually says, you will do a notice per any other public hearing that has to do, that comes before the historic preservation. So even though we're saying the criteria is the same with the planning commission, the process is different. So that's why we made this change, to be consistent with the process as well as the criteria. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions, comments? Commissioner Barnett. Yeah, um, Glenn, um, this whole issue of, of the appeals and the procedures is all in the references is that all also covered in your memo, which is, which was the next item on the agenda? Perhaps no. Is that it's Jeremy's. <laughs> That's different. Yes, the memo concerning quasi-judicial bylaw change just concerns quasi-judicial matters. It doesn't concern the appeal process itself. Yes, I'm. I'm. I'm not. I'm. I'm not sure. I'm comfortable with the idea of taking away a notice of this. I mean, just in the interest of the public, There's, it still has to conform to the rules of the uh, that of what what goes on at a during an appeal. We haven't changed that. Uh, yeah, that's in number three. And, uh, and four, um, so I don't see any, what's har what the harm is in uh, publishing the uh, information that there's going to be an appeal of this, and 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 based on also the fact that there were several people who were at that appeal who were very interested in what was happening, and maybe maybe they found out because of the notice. I don't know. But I don't. I don't. I don't see why we should be burdened to take away a public notice. Yeah. Can you, yeah, what, is there a particular explanation for that piece? Well, I think um, what we're doing here is we're, we're tying HPC to a very similar process planning commission. So, um, and still, it is not a public hearing. So somebody could receive a notice and they'd want to speak on the appeal. They wouldn't be allowed. Um, so it's it's kind of a redundant process that, I guess, it's no particular reason. Um, plus, why do we differentiate the two now? So, so this 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 is exactly how the planning commission's wording right. is read. Okay. Um, any other comments or questions on this section? Uh, let's jump then to the maintenance requirements, which is just the next page, 256-220, I think. So these are the two uh, components that essentially represent the demolition by neglect portion of the ordinance. Um, so it does, in B, it is specific to a historically designated property, correct, right? So unless it's a landmarked property, this doesn't apply. And correct. the only thing that would apply is the, um, land, the um, 
International Property Maintenance Code, which is a generic code that applies to all buildings in the city. That's correct. Any commissioner comments and questions about this piece? No. Okay, the next would be enforcement and penalties. This was a big discussion last time, so. Um, I, if you would, if you could explain a little bit more about the alternative and whether the alternative is meant to be included in the code or whether that's an alternative that we as a commission are deciding between two pieces that would one would be removed and the other put in its place so um commissioners i i, I propose the alternative to c and d which was presented last time so under c and d with that moratorium moratorium which we discuss in length you know concerning penalizing the uh, new property owners and things of that nature so I went back and, and kind of looked at some other jurisdictions. So Loveland and Westminster both have um, the one-year moratorium in their code sections for their historic preservation. So it's pretty much consistent with what staff has proposed previously, was that one-year requirement or one-year ban on all building permits. Uh, Denver and Colorado Springs have the option of restoring. So rather than have a moratorium in place, Instead, the commission will make a decision on how you fix the problem you created. So if you, you know, took out some old windows and put in new vinyl windows that didn't match the structure, um, the commission could order that, hey, you gotta go back and replace the windows to the extent possible or find comparable windows to put in that place, not the vinyl ones you chose. Um, the harshest would be, of course, demolition. If you decided to demolish a historic structure, um, under this code provision, you can say, hey, you gotta build it back very similar to how it used to be. Um, it, it's a different adventure uh, in terms of enforcement mechanism from my perspective. You know, under our existing enforcement powers, we do have the power to enforce compliance. Um, and that was the section we moved down there previously. So if you look at uh, subsection E, Mission enforcement power, or enforcement actions available to the city in the code, we shall have the power to enforce compliance uh, through the court system. That's a pretty onerous bar in terms of city resources of taking someone to court to enforce a historic preservation commission ordinance violation. Whereas the new alternative D kind of spells it out earlier on that HPC is gonna get involved and advise you what you should do to fix your um, unpermitted change to your property. Uh, questions, uh, Ms. Uh, Commissioner Fenster. Yeah, I, <clears throat> excuse me, I question the uh, viability of the uh, C alternative. Um, I'm not sure that uh, any administrative body or non-judicial body uh, would have the power to uh, order the replacement of a torn down structure as opposed to uh, imposing fines and penalties. But uh, replacing the building, uh, I, I doubt that there is authority to do that. I would take that out. Okay, thank you. Other comments and questions about this section? Commissioner Jacoby. Uh, I'm not sure it has to be an either or, actually. Um, I kind of like C, but I agree with you that it sounds difficult to enforce. Um, but perhaps that could be discussed at the time of the infraction with the developer, and maybe they would prefer to rebuild whatever they, they uh, inappropriately tore out and get out of that investment rather than wait a year. It doesn't have to be an either or. We could just throw that in there as another option, another tool in our toolbox. I, I think the only component of that that would perhaps not be true is that it does say the commission would order that. So you couldn't say that it, you couldn't say that it orders you, someone to do it. It would only it would have to be some sort of optional. Right. Well, maybe path. we could change it yeah. the wording so that it is an option. Right. An alternative option. And, that, and that's something we did talk about a little bit. I think there was a point brought up last week about, or last month, sorry, about 
you know, if someone inherit, you know, were to purchase a property that had the moratorium, would they be stuck? And is that bad for the neighborhood? And an option could be the physical reconstruction of a historic building, but that's not the same thing as ordering it, right? Yeah, so, right, 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 right. Yeah, I right, agree. Right. With yeah. Hold on, hold on. <laughs> All right, there you go. I Mission agree Fenster. with stating it as an option. I think that's very good. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Barnard. I like uh, D. D. I don't like the alternative at all. I don't like, I don't think the commission, the Historic Preservation Commission, should have in its power, and I'm not sure it's even legal, to order somebody to do something, to order the reconstruction, and not even sure how that would, we, that would happen. We'd, we'd, we'd have a hearing, we'd order somebody to reconstruct it, and then we'd Staff would go in and review it to see that it was being done in the same manner, or the buildings department. Or I mean, just it's. I mean, aside from the fact that I think it'd be impossible to enforce, I think it's a really bad idea for to give us the power to order people to reconstruct uh, a building. Mr. Chairman, if I mm -hmm. just may add. Briefly, I, I did gloss over the fact that D was also amended. So under subsection D, slightly above. So in addition to the moratoriums which are imposed, uh, the commission has the authority now to shorten or eliminate the moratoriums if the commission finds the impact of the moratorium would unduly impact the district, neighborhood, or neighborhooding, uh, or neighboring property owners, and the owner of the property receives approval for a COA to mitigate or replace the alteration or demolition. So it does, the new subsection D under the first alternative does give some of that remedial power um, to the commission as well. So, so D could stand on its own and the alternative could just be simply removed and it would allow for that possibility. I have no pride in ownership to the alternative. I was just presenting <laughs> options to the commission. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. Okay. Any other... Comments, questions? Just right. one oh, word there. Um, oh, hold on. Get, get your. Yeah, I'm just trying oh, to. Oh, you are. Got to get back to where it was. All right, Commissioner Barnett. Uh, sorry, yes. Yeah. Um, I, this word, you know, well, what do we consider? We're seeing D, right? The, I've never heard the word demolish. Demolishment. Demolition, demolishment, I don't think is a word. Demolition. <laughs> or demolitions, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> well, the demolishment would be the act of demolishing, demolishing. <laughs> and you're talking about something which, you know. Okay, I think if, if we could just make it clean, uh, turn that to demolition and it's consistent with everything else and that's that's clean and easy. Okay. Um, so then let's jump uh, to the last section here which is uh, I believe what was added to um, clarify procedural steps. Yes, Mr. Chairman, following our discussion last month, there was a lot of discussion concerning quasi-judicial matters. This is just pulled directly from our land development code. We apply quasi-judicial matters evenly among city council, land develop, and the planning and zoning commission. Um, we'll, we'll discuss quasi-judicial matters in, in concerning the bylaw change uh, in the next agenda item, uh, but this just is the exact language modified for HPC versus planning and zoning. Okay, so the, in its entirety, it's just... Copy and paste. Copy, okay. All right, thank you. Uh, let's see, questions about this section. Commissioner Barnard. Yeah, um, just, well, I have two questions. One is, it's, it seems to me that we're talking about a lot of things, and I guess because we're making legislative recommendations, um, we don't act in a quasi-judicial manner to do that. But does that mean... You know, 
should we consider whether or not whatever we decide here should be discussed, should, should be exposed to the, to, the, to the public, and we should get some input? Does the city count, will the city council consider when we give them the recommendation that we've actually listened to anybody other than ourselves to do this? I don't know. I, I would think they would, and I would, I would favor whatever we decide generally here. That's my general comment, that we expose it, get feedback on it, and then consider whether we want to change the uh, tentative draft that we've developed. That's one thing. The second thing is I think we have two issues here, two general issues. First issue is the issue of demolition. We spent a lot of time on demolition, and we're actually working ourselves down to where I think we have a, a pretty good draft. We spend, the second issue is this issue of, of uh, how we act as a body. I really think that's a separate issue which deserves a separate set of discussions. Uh, and I think the staff has proposed starting that discussion in the memo that they gave us. Uh, by adopting section, and I, so I don't think any part of 256.240 or any place else where something like that exists in here should be part of our recommendation to the city on demolition issues. I think that should be a separate discussion and divided from the issue on demolition. This is the entire Municipal code section that deals with the Historic Preservation Commission, right? So if if this if that piece were going to be anywhere, it would be here. This isn't just a demolition ordinance. Is that correct? Correct. This is the entirety of the Historic Preservation Commission until the big picture idea of moving into land development code, which big picture idea at this point. Right. Any other commissioner comments on this? Uh, if not, then I'm, I'm, what I'd like to circle back through. Um, so if we were to uh, make a recommendation to staff, and it, it sounded like we that might be possible, uh, and we could but with a few minor changes what i have down just to kind of keep track of all this stuff is the percentages that were in 256070 uh, and that there were three noted two at 75 one at 51 um there's I don't know if there's a 100% consensus around 51, um, but that seemed to be the leading horse, and there were some other notions about lowering it. The, the next piece, uh, I've got to try to keep track of all this. It's, there's a lot of code here. I'm trying to run back through it all. Um, was in that same section, we, we discussed integrity and character, and I made a note to myself that perhaps that could just, that section D of 256070, same section, could simply be reworded to, instead of to say managing the integrity and architectural character, could just say managing the architectural character and integrity, so that it's clear that we're talking about architectural integrity. Um, the next one I have on my list is 256180, which jumps quite a ways down. Um, and that, I guess, really is the notion of whether we're doing 50, if we're, whether we're going to keep this provision as... 
50 years, anything within the subdivision and outside of the original city subdivision, 50 years plus those extra criteria. So we talked about that. And then from there, don't know we had a lot of change discussed until we get down all the way back down to two five six two four th uh, this says two four three zero which doesn't seem right two three zero I think um, that was with the alternative so striking the alternative paragraph so those are the those are the kind of substantive points apart from some broader discussions um, that, and so before we get to the very last piece, I would like to see if we can't, uh, um, if there's, if there's any, if there are any further comments from commissioners about those, those really those three points, the percentage, really it's two points, the percentages and the, the 50 year, um, Filter. Commissioner Jacoby. Just uh, getting back to that 50 year filter, we made a circular argument. I started by saying 75 years, so we could filter out some of that, so we would make less work out of it. Then we said, let's make it 50 to be more consistent. Then we said, everything before 1973, nah, that doesn't make any sense. And it kind of canned the idea. But I, we could go back to saying 75 or 80 years or 100 years but set a guideline that's a little more stringent than what we do uh, for the original city boundaries, just as a catch-all until we get the surveys done. How many years have we been talking about doing surveys for the neighborhoods? We've been talking about uh, that for a while, and we've been talking about this demolition ordinance yes. for a while. We're finally here. But the surveys. So, but, but yes, you're, you're I mean, you're, so my so point, point is, <laughs> until we have the surveys done, maybe we should, you can set the bar higher, make it 80 years, 75, I don't care. It is inconsistent with the 50 that we've done before, but I think there should be something, a, another catch-all in there. Okay, I'd like to get commissioner comments about that specific notion. Commissioner Sibley. Yeah, um, when things come up for demolition, right, somebody applies for a permit for whatever, um, and if it's not in a district or something that's been surveyed before or whatever, uh, you guys had mentioned that, yes, it, you know, there may be notes in the assessor's stuff, blah, blah, blah. How is the public notified on those kinds of things or, or what kinds of notifications are there? And the reason I'm asking is, let's say somebody wants to demolish some house somewhere and it's you know, outside of that 50 year thing, so we don't have to worry about that. However, maybe it's not architecturally significant, but something happened that maybe is worth preserving. How would those things be caught? And I'm kind of, you know, there was a number of years ago when there was that house, and I don't remember the entire story, but the boy that was murdered and da -da -da -da, and that house then became, you know, uh, on the red, it got on the register. So how do you catch those kinds of things? Because I guess that, that would be like, if I was gonna try to pick years or something, I think that would be part of my decision, you know, to try to catch those things. So how do you determine, how do you determine what can get torn down, <laughs> I guess? It's, um, it, today it is an issue, yeah. right? Um, and our goal is to actually get that documentation I think on the other side, the concern is you're an owner and you have no idea that, hey, my plans for my property, I can't do. So um, if we found something that was significant, there would be a notification, at least to the property owner, that, hey, there's some special rules. Um, and that was really why we made this change, basically. It, it was about property rights, primarily. Um, we have a lot of surveys. We don't have every property surveyed. I'm not sure how we 
caught the Zlatan barn. Um, I think we may have had a pretty good inkling of its significance when it came through. So we were able to bring it forward to the HBC. Um, it's, a, it's a risk, but um, to basically put a requirement on everything that's 50 or 70 year, because there potentially might be an important event there, that, that's where, um, at least from a legal standpoint, there was concerns. Sorry. No, I, Actually, I turned myself off too fast. Yeah, sorry. Yep, um, then I guess oh, now I have to like, where, where's that thought? Um, yeah, I, I guess, you know, I, you, you are probably going to lose things, you know, no matter what. And so I guess really maybe the thing is, is, you know, how do we get the public to say, hey, you know, you think something might be important how do we get them to be active and we've got people in certain neighborhoods but mm -hmm. anyways I'm not exactly sure where I'm going with that yeah. but I think I understand the the, the problem but or right. part of it anyways I mean the best answer is it's significant it becomes a landmark yeah um, okay. and we have a number of ways of doing that either the owner or uh, somebody brings in a petition okay. you know who is not the owner so all right Commissioner uh, Fenster, did you have a no. question? No. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Barnett. Yes, I'm, I'm trying. I would like, if I could, for Commissioner Jacoby to explain clear, clear where where the word changes would be that he's talking for, about for the fifty or seventy-five year, where that would appear in this. Uh, the fifty-one versus seventy-five. Oh, the. Idea that if it's seventy five years old. Oh. Yeah. Let me transfer the mic over for his response. Yeah. Commissioner. Where's and, the, what page is this? This is and, and if you'd like me to tell you I can do you do recall that. which page? Yes. Um, so it's section two five six one eight zero, it's page fifty four. And it would take it would take a little wordsmithing because the heading is review of permits for and demolition for moving of structures 50 years in age and older. So it we've basically set that bar at 50 and then added all these other filters in there. Um, so that would be under A2, it looks we're, like. Right. You're talking about A2, but we would have to pull 50 from everything and then add it back in, right? Because we've we the the heading is structures fifty years and older, and that you so you, okay. you can't have a subheading for right. structures that are seventy. You'd have yeah. to rework some of the some of the language right. to to just talk about structures and then say in the city subdivision fifty years outside the city subdivision. So you could change the first line. The purpose of this section is to prevent the loss of older structures that may have historical architectural significance. Take the 50 out, and then uh, uh, within the original city subdivision, any structure, I, um, 50 years or older, I suppose, you could throw that in there. And then uh, outside the original city subdivision, any structure identified in an architectural cultural survey, da 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 da, da or over 50 year old. Yeah, five so years, 50, the, you know. What ends up happening, though, I think with, with what you're suggesting is that that number two just says outside the original city subdivision, any structure 75 or 80 or 100 years old. Right. And all the other stuff goes away. It, because well, you could have something that, that had history behind it, some historic that's, well, that's not old enough yet to necessarily meet the criteria, but maybe some event occurred there. And so it's, it came up on a cultural resource survey, right? But it might not be that old yet. So in that way, it might be caught separately. <clears throat> OK. Does that at least answer your question, Commissioner Barnett? All right. Great. Commissioner uh, Gayu. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you. I did not give you the opportunity to do that on the record. Um, I would also like to, I mean, personally, I'm fine with the 50, so I'll just put that out there. Um, 
but I also I would like to consider the public comment about this section that it does expand to cultural resources and not just historic, which is very limited view of what's important to our our city. All right. Any other commissioner comments there? I I uh, I I really understand what you're saying, but the, the my fear is that we end up with some 75 year whatever it is doesn't matter what it is everything else gets scraped and the next time that this gets all fixed is who knows when down the road and so I, as much as I understand and where you're coming from and I, I personally I would probably be fine with the way we've written it but that's just me as one commissioner um, okay so I don't know that we have absolute consensus on that particular piece um, either I do we we do have consensus on striking the alteration out of that um, enforcement and penalties is there any, are there any commissioners that feel that that's a bad idea or that we can just leave D and strike the alternative uh, um, I've jumped to two five six uh, two four three it's at page 61 Commissioner Barnett. Uh, I just want to uh, support what, what we get there to what you're saying. The comment that was made about adding the word cultural, and that would be in 256.180, paragraph A, to add the word cultural after the word comma, cultural or architectural significance. I, I, I think it's in there, though, right? No, it says no? that may have historical or architectural significance. Okay. okay. So cultural, cultural is later right where we talk about. Okay. Um, yeah. So. Okay. Right. Throughout. Is that so? Staff, is that clear? Yep. Okay. All right. Thank you, Commissioner Barnett, to clar for clarifying that. I missed. I was looking at the cultural sur sur survey and thought we had it in there. Okay. So. Um, I, I'm just going to comment on the 256240, the very last uh, uh, piece that was added with decision-making capacities. Um, it's it's my sense that a that this is the process that we have. We had an omission in, a, in the HPC code that made it unclear that that's the process that we have. Adding this back in makes uh, you know clarifies something that we've, we 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 have identified that is um, was missing and i don't know that this commission is really charged with trying to determine what the right procedures for uh, decision making bodies should be so uh, as much as i appreciate where your concern commissioner barner over this component i would be in favor of including it in now and getting it in and getting it corrected because i don't know that this commission is going to change that whole process specific to this commission and and and, and citywide or that that or, or at least that this is an appropriate place if it were ha if it happened elsewhere and it got changed across the board then that's a whole nother um process and discussion that's just my feeling um, are there any other comments on that component? no any other? All right. commissioner Gayu. my comment is it's kind of a it's a little sideways in that in the past um, a number a small number of commissioners have gone and spoken with people that have been in front of the commission about their project that was in front of the commission, which obviously is ex parte. <laughs> and so I just want to be clear that that is not something that we are supposed to or allowed to do. 
Yes, Commissioner. So that goes back to, I'm trying to think what Saturday I was with you all. I think we been in April. Um, April Fool's Day for the retreat. <laughs> When we talk about quasi-judicial ex parte communications, regardless of if the commission decides to go forward with this addition or not, our guidance is the same, that when it, you're acting in quasi-judicial quasi fashion, uh, which is certificate of appropriateness, certificate of hardship, and this um, economic incentive application. Those are three quasi-judicial matters, and the commission's, my advice is always to avoid any ex parte communications, okay. which would include discussions with the applicant until such time that the History Preservation right. Commission has made their ruling and it's final. Yeah, we were, I mean, I mean, this is past staff, but we were actually asked by the staff to do that. So I just want everybody to be clear that that's, that's not something that should be happening. So. And again, the remedy for that is disclosure or recusal. If it's limited contact, so I think the example was if someone came up to you and said, hey, how do I make my application more persuasive? And you provide some generalized comments before you realize it's a quasi-judicial matter, disclosure is fine. Uh, if you feel a substantial contact, so that it might influence your ability to be impartial, then recusal is required. But it's up to each commissioner to make that decision for themselves. But so how, I'll get there, yep. Uh, a follow-up. Um, we do, it, once, once something's on the agenda and noticed, I mean, it is, we have the opportunity to go to the property to visually, I mean, I generally think that's something we ought to be doing. And so if we are going to the property to look, and we obviously can't be, you know, we can't just force, we're not, we're not permitted to be inside unless we're invited to be inside, but we are going to the property in order to understand better the property. So where's the line if if some you know if there's a component that clearly would be better observed from an interior and we're permitted to go inside, are we able to just say look, I I appreciate this opportunity. I would like to see it, but you can't talk to me. Is that how to right? I mean, how do you handle that because there's you have to be there sometimes. Yep. No, I completely understand. I think site visits was one area of major discussion back in April, because site visits do get difficult. A neighbor comes out and talks to you while you're in the driveway, or the homeowner comes out and talks to you in the driveway. You say, hey, I, I can't be, I don't wanna be influenced, I don't wanna have any improper communication, I'm just taking a look just to better evaluate and make it a better decision. And I think your, your point, Mr. Chairman, you know, if the homeowner is willing to invite you, you know, I think it's fine to say, hey, can I look inside to get a better view? I can't talk to you, but I just want to get a better view. Um, I think that's fine, but I would still prefer that staff did that, including a staff report. I'd prefer it was staff doing it as opposed to a commissioner. So if it came to the commission's attention that you know we really need to see from the inside, I'd prefer that the applicant provides pictures to the staff, or staff somehow arranges for photographs or video. That way, it's on the record. Everyone's seen it. There's no ex parte communication concerns. Okay, thanks for the clarification. Uh, Commissioner Barnard. Uh, yes, I, uh, in, with respect to um, D, um, three, um, it says the commission must not consider ex parte communications. And it says, any member of the commission shall disclose any any involvement expert and fully describe it. So, on the one hand, it says that it can't be considered. In, this, in the next paragraph, it says, "Well, it can be disclosed." So that's contrary to it being considered. If it's disclosed, then it you know it's for the purpose of consideration. That's number one. I don't think that paragraph. I think that paragraph needs reworking. I don't care if it was popped in from the Land Development and Planning Zoning Commission. I mean, they might have gotten it wrong. There's no reason why we should get it wrong. All right. Secondly, um, oh, that was the second point. Um, sorry, lost it. Um, oh, yeah, the idea of if we do have that conversation and 
we disclose it. Then we're just informed by counsel that we can either recuse ourselves or disclose it, and there's no guidance for that. I mean, if I, if I don't recuse myself, can the commission force me to recuse myself? Uh, we know this issue of recusal has come up nationally. <laughs> With no guidance for it, it's very difficult to have any kind of enforcement. So I, I don't think, I don't, I don't, I'd be interested if staff, I'm, I don't really want to get into a long discussion on this. I, I think this paragraph needs to be re rewritten a little bit. And so I'm not prepared. I don't think we should decide on this. I don't think we should decide on this today. I don't think we should decide on the whole section today, but specifically, I think this paragraph has given us in, incomplete advice on how to act. Uh, City Attorney, could you respond to just clarifying what, what that, the, at least the very first question? So the very first question, you know, my, the way I'm reading it is the commission must not consider ex parte communication. That's the rule. The exception is if somehow you came across inadvertent ex parte communication, you shall disclose it. I don't think those two points are contrary to each other. It's saying don't do it. If it happens, you have to disclose it. It's how I'm reading it, and I think that's how it should be read. Chairman, that's not what it says, okay? It doesn't say don't do it. It says the commission may not consider it. It doesn't say a commissioner may not do this. To do what uh, Mr. Terrell is suggesting, we have to, it would have to be a specific admonition in law telling a commissioner that you may not, a commissioner may not have any ex parte communication. Okay. Uh, commissioner Jacoby. Can we substitute for must not consider, just say should avoid, the commission should avoid ex parte communication? Uh, that would, maybe that would clarify it enough for you, Doug, and maybe that would, because you still would have to recuse, it doesn't deal with the recusal issue, but it would maybe clarify things. Commissioner yeah. Barnard. Yeah, I'm uncomfortable with the should not. I believe the goal of this is to is based on all, everything I've heard and read is to that this to make it very clear that we're not supposed to or should not allowed to engage in any ex parte communication, and if somehow or other we do, we disclose that, and then the commission can do with it as it as it wishes. But I don't think it should be a um, an a, 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 a what the commission must not do. Uh, if you want to make a statement that the commission must not consider ex parte communication, why well, that should be a separate paragraph. Then, as far as actions of the commissioner and what the commissioner um, should, you know, shall not do or may not do, whatever depends what preference you, you. The idea that it's mandated that a commissioner not have an ex parte communication. And if, it, if they do that, they're not going to go to jail. They just have to disclose it. Uh, Commissioner Fenster. Yeah, uh, I think that needs to be. Uh, that, oops, I think that needs to be reworded. Uh, I don't. I I don't think it's enough to say that uh, the commission should not consider ex parte communications. I think that should recite that the the commission shall not engage in ex parte communications. Uh, so I think that part of that phrase or sentence uh, should be reworded to that extent uh, because the way it's worded now, it almost invites ex parte communications. So, uh, and then having said that, uh, the commission uh, must not engage in ex parte communications, the next sentence would properly follow, I think. So is your suggestion to just revise the first sentence to say commissioners shall not engage in ex parte communication? Yes, sir. Okay. I would have no problem with that. And I am of the mindset that I would very much like to vote on this tonight and move it forward. Chairman? <laughs> <laughs> Chairman? Yes. 
Yes. Without sure. beating a dead horse, but trying to get the horse in proper shape so it can race. Um, the uh, the second sentence says, any member of the commission voting on an application shall publicly disclose their involvement in any parks. So basically, if I say, okay, I don't want to vote on this application, so I'm not going to vote on it, so I'll go have an ex parte communication, and I'll sit with the person, and I'll work with them, and I'll, you know, you could have two commissioners go and do that. It still wouldn't be a meeting. And they could have that discussion, and they just agree they wouldn't vote on it. Because the only condition here for an ex parte communication is if you're voting on an application. Okay. I, I mean, I'm not sure I find, I mean, I, that seemed, you're right, that's a loophole, but I don't know how we're going to, I don't know that we need to rewrite the language to, to try and prevent that. I think everyone who's on this commission's generally good and, you know, they're well intended. So the, I, I guess I don't, I don't personally have I a fear. I would just delete the words yeah. voting on an application. Not needed. Any member of the commission shall publicly, shall publicly disclose their involvement in ex parte communications. Period. Okay. So the commission commissioners shall not engage in ex parte communication. Any member of the commission shall publicly disclose their their involvement. I mean, can we please? Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, let's see. Hold on. Uh, Commissioner Guy. So. What this is saying is if you want to participate in the discussion of the application but not vote on it, then you have to disclose your ex parte communication. Right. If you'd like to recuse yourself, you don't have to disclose anything. You can just step out of the room and not participate. So there's, there's kind of three positions you can take. You can not have the ex parte and vote and discuss. You can have the ex parte, disclose it, discuss but not vote, or you can recuse and take yourself out of the situation altogether. Which is why it needs to be rewritten. Because that's no, that's exactly what it's saying. Okay. Right? Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. That, 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 this is not an open discussion. Okay, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Fenster has the floor. Yeah, I think, uh, I think that needs to be reworded. Uh, I think <clears throat> I think uh, it should recite that the commission shall not engage in ex parte communications, and then the next sentence should uh, recite that any member of the commission shall publicly disclose any involvement in ex parte communication and shall recuse. I don't think you can engage in an ex parte communication and not recuse. I think that's mandatory. I, I would disagree with that, actually. Yeah. I think I, I think you could have a what what amounts to because we've uh, unknowing unwittingly done it, <laughs> uh, and it did not adversely affect the the outcome or the procedure. It was a minor. I think I think you have to give some. Um, Allowance for commissioners to acknowledge a minor, um, well, uh, a minor pass. So if it's a minimal communication, I'm not sure it even needs to be disclosed. But I'm talking about communications of substance, where I think the commissioner should recuse. Okay. Okay. I'm going to call a vote uh, for a vote on this. We have um, we have essentially if, if we we've got one, two, three, four, five, six items that would potentially be um, changed. The first one would be the percentages in two five six zero seven zero. Second would be that wordsmithing of managing architectural character integrity in the same. The third would be the 50 year designation and whether that should, any of that language should change. The fourth would be this uh, notion of uh, adding cultural significance to architectural. And I don't have the code sec written down, but I'm hoping staff has. And then if there's any changes proposed to the language of this last section in D3. 
and I would prefer to get a motion on the floor and um, and work through it tonight. Uh, did you count five? One, two, three, four. Oh, I'm sorry. There was one small change about um, changing the demolishment to demolition. Sorry, that, that was the other one. Okay, all right. That was I when my went ran down my list. That's what I was writing as I went. I remember there being a discussion about the language we changed regarding appeal. Have, have we got? Have we decided whether to go with that or to not? I remember. Commissioner Barnard was concerned about taking out the public notice. Oh, right. Thank you for reminding me of that. I somehow lost track of that. Okay. Seven potential. All right. Commissioner Gayu. So do we need to make seven separate motions? No. One motion that would include whatever proposed changes. Can we break it into non-controversial and controversial <laughs> so that we're not here all night <laughs> picking at the one thing that people care about? <laughs> we, can, we can try to have that discussion prior to making a motion, I suppose. If we, uh, I, I think we have, we have two, the wordsmithing is no one questions. We have, so three of those are just wordsmithing. So then we have the percentage. 51 something other. Can we take straw polls? Is there any issue with yeah. that? Yeah, yeah. okay. No, it's part of the discussion. <laughs> yeah. So right. maybe we can take a straw poll on each of those ones and then we can figure out which ones we can just yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you for that. I'll, let's just go down. We'll, we'll skip the, if we can just skip the mic because it's going to take forever. Just from this end, uh, percentage. You said you 51. 51. 51. Okay, 51. So 51 is the percentage that would be put in in 2.56070. There are two places where that occurs, and that would align with the 51 in paragraph F or whatever that was. Okay. The next uh, component was the um, 256180, which has to do with whether or not we ought to have a blanket 50 year and outside the subdivision have a filter or whether we ought to um, make it 50 years within the original subdivision and some greater number of years outside the original subdivision period and then that just so everybody understands that would trigger paragraph b which is a liaison and uh, some member of the council reviews a permit application to see if there's um, historical significance so we'll go the other way <laughs> okay Okay, I would probably keep it the way it is. As written. As written. Make it as written. Okay, yep. all right. So, um, it appears as written is our straw. Okay, then um, I've lost track of exactly where that, uh, no, never, I found it again, okay. The uh, appeal in 256.210, D1 did note an appeal hearing given according to this chapter, excluding the requirement to publish in a newspaper of general circulation. So if that were to be stricken, does that, what, what does that do process-wise um, from an appeal? Does it change anything or not. Do you read the legal ads? I, I'm just asking. That's <laughs> basically what it's saying is we don't publish in the paper. We can do it quicker because the newspaper has a lead time. Um, that's what it means from a business standpoint. Is it published somewhere? Is it published on the web or some? We post this, I think. 
Yeah, so we post, um, there's a notice sign that gets, physical sign that gets posted on the property in question. Um, and then, of course, we do post on our website the agenda and such. I believe the public hearings get posted sooner or than later. So, okay. I post them when Maria tells me it's time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we'll we'll do another straw poll whether or not we're in favor of striking that provision or keeping it in and we'll start back over here. I think I'm good with this one as written as well. It is up to you. Yes, yes. as written. As written. I'm also as written. <laughs> okay, fair enough. <laughs> wow. Okay. That's right. That's you that's okay. That's okay. Um, all right. So now we are down to the um, the last section, 256240. We've been discussing this paragraph D3 about ex parte communication. Yeah. Commissioner Barner. I didn't know when to bring this up, and I don't know if it should just be put to a different, to a different time for discussion. But during the uh, uh, appeal yesterday, yesterday, Tuesday, question came up whether or not the property owner said, well, maybe I'll just, uh, you know, if I can't afford it, I'll just ask to be removed as a historic landmark. And the discussion was held as to, well, how would you go about that? And nobody really had any answer. The it's staff didn't have an answer, and the uh, council didn't know for sure um, how you do that. Uh, and I don't know if that's something that, since we're talking about landmarking things, whether we should take that way deal with that. Do we have? It's in 2.56.160, revocation of designation. So we actually okay. have it in there. I'm sorry. Yep. And, and to the chair, that we did make that point to the commit to the council. We re I, I was looking for the specific code reference, but it basically defers back to the designation. So they did get that information. Okay. Thank you. What is that? Two point five six. Two point five six one six zero. It's page fifty three. Revocation. Okay. What talking about a homeowner revoking its his own its own his or her own designation? Talk, this is preservation revocation of a historic district. Talking about I have a. Dick, you have an historic home? Mm -hmm. Okay, you decide you don't want to have a historic home anymore. How do you do it? Get a written petition. That's got to, all the property owners have to agree with you in the district? No, that's, that's, there's two different things. This is covering both. Okay, so uh, I'm looking for it. Yeah. Just revocation of a designation. So the designation refers to both the landmark designation or historic des or designation. So this is covering, if I understand it correctly, and city attorney looks like you want to respond there, please do clarify. Yeah, no, exactly. That first sentence, a petition for revocation of a designation may be submitted by the commission, council, or the owner of the property, or owners of the property. The second sentence deals with the historic district. So rather than have a revocation section for district and property, it's just the same paragraph. There's, there is a process for both. Maybe, Chairman, I don't want to jump in without being recognized. So. All right. Thank you, Commissioner Barnett. Oh, I thought I had yeah. No, I, you had, did have me on, but I, it was from previous times. So. Okay. Um, I'm happy. I'm, okay. All right. It just seems to be, it seems to be that A is dealing with two completely different things. And it's kind of a jumble as to which one applies to which. Because A, 1, 2, 3, and 4 are supposed to be subcategories of A. But A is, has two different things. One is when you want to revoke the historic district. And the other one is when a, somebody wants to just get out of being a historic property. And then, well, you know, I don't think it breeds... Uh, okay. Um, 
Commissioner Gayu. So what it's saying is that, I mean, the, the procedure is the same, whether it's for an individual property or a historic district. Procedure is the same. It's just if it's an individual property, the revocation can be either us, the commission, the city council, or the owners of the property. But if it's a historic district, then 51% of the people who own property in that district have to agree to put the revocation forward. But once you get past that second sentence, everything else is the same, whether it's an individual property or a historic district. That's why it's lumped together, because it's the same thing. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Jacoby. This brings up the issue that I, I mentioned, I forget how many meetings ago, maybe we should consider consequences for revocation of a designation. Uh, an owner of a home could apply for a designation. They can save literally thousands of dollars on permits and taxes with improvements. And then they can decide they want further improvements that aren't approved and say, oh, here's your plaque back with no consequence. And I, I think that maybe, I mean, we don't necessarily, again, it's private property, we don't wanna handcuff them necessarily uh, in one way or the other. In this current uh, house, this woman bought this house two years ago and she knew it was historically designated. She could have read the restrictions on this. You know, I, I think you could say she has a difficult argument, but if she decides, it's her home, if she pursues this, you know, should there be some kind of consequence for that? It, it's too late for her, but I think it's something we should consider in the future. Thank you. Okay, uh, I'm going to jump. I mean, I think we have, I think the revocation code language basically handles that process is from my perspective on that. Um, so let, let's jump back to that 2.56240, the very last piece. Uh, notion about ex parte communication. So if if there's, so if we need to wordsmith it or whether we, uh, if, if you want to wordsmith it, I'd like something very specific <laughs> to be proposed by a commissioner, not li lift it open up. So uh, let's see, I'm gonna go, I went, so. Uh, I think that uh, yeah. 2.40, Paragraph D, item three, needs reworking, and I don't know how. I, I could possibly draft something. I'd be if you want to delegate it to work with the staff uh, on it. Um, but you know that you could delegate it to me and somebody else, and we can work with the staff and come up with something uh, that will accomplish the goals. I think we all agree what we want to try to accomplish. Number one. We want to accomplish the fact that their that their ex parte commission communications are not something that we look upon light, lightly, and we and we we don't think they should be done. It's not legalese, so we don't think they should be done. We think that if somebody does it, that they should uh, disclose it, and then the issue of recusal, I think, is uh, shouldn't even be discussed. That's, that comes down to what council said earlier. Uh, it's really a question of whether it was incidental or substantial. And you're not going to be able to draft that. That's, that's a, unless you want to say incidental or substantial, but then you're going to, what's what and what's the other thing. So I think you just say you, you shouldn't be done and, it, uh, and that you disclose, your, you could dis disclose it if you did it. Okay. Commissioner Jacoby. Oops. We make it official there and get the yeah, the guess, this limitation on since the we're discussing this. member thing. You know, I think the wording is not perfect, but I think it communicates the point enough and to move forward, I'm good and I'm happy to keep it as written. Okay. Um, I generally feel the same way. Um, I will ask a question of staff after this poll just to, for, for clarity, however. I, again, I think it's fine as written. I mean, there could probably be a slight addition between the difference between a, a you know, disclosing and then recusing. That would be, be the only addition I would make. Commissioner okay. Fenster. I think that paragraph needs to be rewritten. 
Okay. Monsieur Sebou. Uh, yeah, the only thing that I really had to add, and it was already talked about, was um, that you may recuse yourself. I don't know that you have to. Um, other than that, I, my, I'm fine. I, yeah, I don't have a big problem with this. I, a little bit of wordsmithing, I guess, is it. So. Okay. Okay, so that's the only thing that is even remotely up in the air at this point. Is there, I'm, I would really prefer not to push this off until next month. So is there any mechanism that we have that, to suggest that, you know, Commissioner Barner suggested that perhaps, you know, we could dedicate or uh, assign um, a council person to work with staff to get the language to where they were happy with it. I don't know if that's, if we can make that part of a motion, it feels a little muddy but I would like to ask if that's a possibility. Well, first, I guess the risk would be, is, does it become substantial enough that we feel everybody ought to see it? Um, and I, I think I counted four folks that like it as written, I, I guess. So maybe just call the question. I, I, I understand. I, I was counting as well, but I also want to put the question out there formally. <laughs> I don't know if Jeremy has something to add. I, I don't, I'm not familiar with the mechanism for that. I don't know how we'd, we'd do that. I would, I'd be concerned about one commissioner or, multi, or two commissioners and a staff member taking authorship and possibly changing what that says. Um, I will reiterate that, again, this is just from the Land Development Code. I understand that People don't like that it what it says, but it's it's consistent with what it says for planning and zoning. Uh, and the last point is just that we're still just a recommending body for these code changes. So if city council decides they want to rework that section, we can rework it and then redo it with planning and zoning as well. Right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I would like to call for a motion. Is there anyone, if there's anyone here that would like to make it, I would entertain it. Commissioner Gayu. I have a motion that we oh God, do I have a motion? change the 75% to the 51% in section 2.56.070 uh, and that we uh, leave well, that's as written, yeah. so that's fine. So what else? Uh, a slight wordsmithing on changing architectural character to, or the character integrity to architectural character and integrity. You know what I'm saying. Um, strike the, uh, the alternative from section that you know which section it is. And, <laughs> uh, and then we are... Uh, adding cultural to um, historic and architectural significance, and I believe we are leaving everything else as written. Okay, I have a motion. Do I have a second? I'll second. Okay, so we have a motion from Commissioner Gayu and a second from Commissioner Sibley. Is there any further discussion? No, I will... Then uh, call for a vote. All in favor? Yep. Ask for a roll call vote? Sure. Well, we're going to do a roll call vote. So, uh, Commissioner Sibley. Yes. Commissioner Fenster. Opposed. Opposed. Commissioner Gayu. Yep. Yes. <laughs> uh, Commissioner Fenster. I'm, I'm sorry. Gosh, I'm, uh, it's getting late. Commissioner, <laughs> Commissioner Jacoby. Fenster, Mr. Fenster's over there. Yes, approved. Okay, Commissioner Barnett. Yes. Okay. And as a chair, I vote yes. So the motion passes four to two. All right. Thank you all for your participation and uh, all the discussions and for staff for walking us through all this. Okay. Um, 
we do have a couple of other agenda items. Uh, the next one was a discussion of quasi-judicial de decisions and commission bylaws. And I can multitask commissioners. So while I'm pulling it up, I will also talk about the proposed bylaw change. The proposed bylaw change represented, presented by staff and the city attorney's office is present consistency among its quasi-judicial boards for the city of Longmont. The Planning and Zoning Commission has adopted a bylaw change um, very similar in form to what is proposed here. And this is exactly what city council has adopted for their rules of procedure. And it goes back to the quasi-judicial hearings. So the concern is that uh, during public invited be heard segments of commission meetings, anyone can speak on any topic. Um, unfortunately, that opens up the possibility that someone might come and speak on quasi-judicial matters. Here, it doesn't present a fair hearing if that happens because public can't hear the comments made by the applicant. Perhaps the applicant doesn't hear the comment made by the member of the public. So to ensure due process, the city attorney's office and staff is recommending this bylaw change, which gives the chair discretion to direct a speaker to terminate all remarks on upcoming matters where the commission may hold a quasi judicial hearing. Uh, if that happens, the speaker should be instructed that they can attend the public hearing on the matter or they can submit written materials to city staff for inclusion in the record. Uh, this is again consistent with planning and zoning commission along with city council. And it uh, goes back to the principle of due process and fairness for both members of the public along with the applicant. Great, thank you. Are there questions for city attorney? Yeah, questions or comments, sure. Yeah, uh, let's see, Commissioner Guy. Um, I, could you expound a little bit on um, how you're defining, I think, upcoming matter so it really comes down to once we know it's coming up on the radar uh, and that really triggers when an application has been filed that's really the defining moment is once the application has been filed that's when the quasi judicial restriction should go in place how and so that's will we know that like how's the chair going to know that to be able to stop somebody talking about that? it's traditionally been a communication by the liaison or planning director as kind of a Hey, wave, wave our hands, start winking, something like that, a cue. Um, it's a little bit different where we're talking planning and zoning where we have a planning map that shows active developments going on versus here we don't have that same kind of process in place. So it comes down to the liaison staff kind of waving the chairman, hey, Mr. Chairman, quasi-judicial matter. That actually happened at our last planning and zoning commission, I believe. Glenn pointed out we were getting into a realm of quasi-judicial matters and we kind of addressed it if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> I, I do know the city attorney also notifies city council. Um, I think when we get an application for quasi-judicial and um, we can certainly do that with you as well when we know. Send you an email. Hey, just so you know where you have an application on whatever it is. Okay, Commissioner Fenster. Uh, neither of those paragraphs makes any sense to me. And unless they were substantially changed, I'd vote against them. I don't, I don't understand their purpose. And whatever is their purpose, it's mixed up particularly in the second paragraph. Commissioner Barnett. Yeah, I think uh, this whole thing is overkill. And, uh, I don't think it's, uh, and I think it's unclear and it puts burdens on us, especially in the issue of upcoming matters. Um, yeah. And I don't, uh, you know, I, I think that's a fairly uh, loosey goosey term. It doesn't mm -hmm. have any place in, in bylaws. Um, if you want to make uh, I, I, understand, I understand the issue of ex parte communication and, uh, during 
for things that are set for hearing or that we have determined will be set for hearing. But if we haven't made a determination based on the recommendations of staff that something is going to be subject to a hearing, I mean, it could be anything. And yeah. I just don't, I don't want that burden of, uh, of that. So I don't, I, I would, if, if it's not, if the language is not changed, I would vote against it. Any other questions or comments? From my perspective as the chair, I mean, I found this a little maybe over much for the HPC, um, just because we get so f so little comment, um, and typically, if we have a public hearing, I would make the point that anyone coming up in the beginning for public invited to be heard would only be something that's not on the agenda. Now, I understand that somebody, well, for example, we had, we had, um, we had a whole pile of people, probably five or six or maybe even eight came in and asked uh, uh, to talk about the bone farm. Now, that wasn't anything that ended up on our uh, agenda because it's not under our jurisdiction. Um, but if we had eight people show up about some potential development in a historic, on a historic property or something like that, are we really going to somehow tell them I mean, so this, this provision would basically say you don't have the right to speak now. You need to come back during the, you know, when it ends up on the agenda. Is it, that's right? Correct. Yeah. And it's my understanding that this was requested by a commissioner. I might be mistaken. Wait, who? I, I believe it was a commissioner. I don't recall which of you may have requested this, but. Yeah. I don't, I think we, I think there was some. Uh, Maybe there's questioning about discussion about yeah. I think there was a discussion about the fact that this was happening in other in the planning uh, commission and in the city council and so um, it was offered to discuss it here I, I don't love it either I probably wouldn't um, just you know again are we at, are we being asked to vote on this to include it in the bylaws or is this just an in, I mean it is a it's a business, let's see, it's just a new business piece. So do we have, or is this an actionable thing where we're really gonna we're call for a vote or is this just a piece of information for consideration? I, I think everything in here is a true statement that should apply regardless of whether or not it's adopted in the bylaws. If someone makes a comment concerning a quasi-judicial matter, if, if the chair feels comfortable instructing, say, hey, bring that back to public hearing, it's not the right time that's by law, that's fine. Um, if the chair feels comfortable and the commission feels comfortable just knowing that ex parte communications are no-nos even during public invited to be heard, I, I, then I leave this to your, the commission's discretion to adopt it or not. Okay, all right, thank you. Uh, let's see, Commissioner Barnard. Yes, I would move that uh, we uh, utilize option three and that we reject the amendment to the 2023 bylaws. Okay, there is a motion on the floor. I second it. Okay, so we have a motion um, on the floor to um, not to include the proposed amendment in the bylaws, seconded by Commissioner Jacoby. Um, no, no, it, no. Yep, didn't? No, what? motion to reject the amendment to the bylaws by Commissioner Barnard. Seconded. Second. Yeah. Uh, all right. So, okay. Thought that's thought that's what I said, but I'm getting tired. Um, yes. The motion was by Commissioner Barnett, second by Jacoby. Any discussion? No. Okay. Well, then I guess I'll call for a vote. All uh, and I, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Two opposed. Okay. Uh, so that motion carried four to two as well. So we're not including it. You just, 
You made your motion passed by four to two. Okay, there are no changes to the bottom. Okay, so then I, so moving on to the item three. So what I'm gonna ask, so there was a point made during the, um, the public invited to be heard about the fact that this wasn't, there was no nothing in the packet. So can we ask what, I mean, is there information that we, why was there nothing in the packet, I guess, is the simple way to ask that. We put this on, uh, on the request of Commissioner Jacoby. Right. So I'm not really sure whether, I, I think what you would say is if after his explanation, yes, staff should do something, that would be a motion. But I don't really know what okay. it's gonna be. So this was really just put out there at the as we requested, just for the discussion. Right. To have here. Right. Okay, okay. And I know that we've been pushing this off and off and off, so. Um, uh, I will uh, give uh, Commissioner Jacoby the floor here to explain. Okay. Um, well, as you all know, the Historic East Side has been trying to deal with the conservation overlay and pursuing this. Uh, the current code was written in 1997. It was not revised in 2018. So for 26 years, it's been on the books and has not been used. And I believe the main reason it has not been used is not because there is not interest, but it, it, it is functionally unable to be used easily because of the expense. Um, what the, the code is written, if you read through the whole thing, the conservation overlay code says basically you have to have a cohesive community or a neighborhood, and then the uh, neighborhood group leader has to write for an application. Uh, and they write an application and send it in, and then it is treated as rezoning. Rezoning is usually done by developers who have money who are trying to change things, whereas conservation is usually done by neighbors who don't have resources. So even though it follows the same procedure, it is inherently different. Uh, several of the, the uh, code, the problems with the rezoning code, one is it requires that we notify not everybody, only everybody in the neighborhood, but everyone a thousand feet in every direction around the neighborhood. Well, if you're not making a change, you shouldn't have to notify everybody outside of the neighborhood. If you're gonna make restrictions and the conservation overlay, yes, the neighborhood needs to know. And currently with the way the rules are written, the planning director can waive that requirement and reduce the expense. We, the neighborhood still has to have mailers to every household in the neighborhood explaining that we are going to do this and what it is, and that's a significant expense. Uh, currently, uh, the Neighborhood Group Leaders Association uh, does have funds, and the, our, the East Side neighborhood did apply for those funds for the mailers, and we have money to do that now to send I believe two letters out to every household in the neighborhood. But then there was the initial planning meeting and at the planning meeting, it turns out that there is a fee for doing this. The fee for the neighborhood would be $2,250, I think was the estimate. And it's based on the size of the neighborhood. Um, the planning director does not have authority to waive that fee right now. And so what I am simply asking is that we make a recommendation while we're putting these code changes in that the planning director has the authority to waive that fee so that neighborhoods could pursue a conservation overlay if they decide to. Currently, his, uh, national historic districts uh, have some economic benefits, but there are no restrictions on what you do within them. Okay, the historic east side has a four and a half block, five block historic district, but the neighborhood itself is much larger than that. And again, there's no restrictions on what is done there. And we would like to restore restrictions that were in place until the 2018 code was rewritten. At that time, the city promised that they would get to it. If we could just get this new code passed, we'll get to that sometime. Well, that's been five years and it hasn't happened yet. And um, again, 
we don't have the neighborhood does not have the financial wherewithal to make the change. Um, it's been suggested we go to city council to make uh, to see if they will provide direction to planning so that we can waive the fee. And the neighborhood is actually pursuing that right now. So hopefully you'll be hearing soon at some point about that. But not every neighborhood has the energy or the organization to do that that the historic east side has. And I'm thinking specifically of the historic west side neighborhood, which is much larger and the fee would be larger. And I think the code needs to be tweaked a little bit to be usable. So that's why I made the motion uh, last time that we recommend to modify the city code to allow the planning director to be able to waive the application fee for a conservation overlay for applications from city designated neighborhood groups. And if we can just vote on that quickly tonight, I would love it. It doesn't seem that controversial, but if we want a discussion, we can table it another day. I don't think there's any reason to table it. I wanted Great. to put it on the agenda so that there was an opportunity to Excellent. discuss it as an agenda item instead of during uh, HBC comments. Excellent. So, that so we, I made the formal. motion. Would, yes. like, would someone yeah. like to second no, no, that? No, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I, that was, you just described your motion from last time. I would okay. like to open the floor to any other commissioners that have a question about this. If no one does, then, then we can go there. Right, so any commissioners that would have a question or comment about the clarification. Okay. I haven't heard I did not rec the chair did not recognize the motion just so that we can be real clear about this. I <laughs> so would you please if hold on. We, all right. Commissioner Guy who has a comment. Thank you. Uh, I'll put the motion forward as stated by Commissioner Jacoby. Thank you. Okay. Get this rolling. Okay. We have a motion. Can I second it? Yes. All right. <laughs> there you go. All right. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? None. Okay, thank you. That passes unanimously. Thank you. All right. I know everybody wants to get out of here. Okay. So my understanding would be that we've just directed staff to propose a change in the code to allow for, basically to include the um, neighborhood associations as uh, an element that can be qualify for waivers. Do you have any questions as to what direction you need? Because I'm assuming that what you would then do is bring back a little revision to us just to, to comment upon or? T typically what we do is, is we does discuss it with city council okay. um, before we do additional work. Okay. Um, so how we do that, I'm, I'm not quite sure yet, but um, we'll figure that out. Sometimes the liaison would bring that forward um, and see if there is enough interest from all the council to, to do that. So we will figure that out. Um, okay. And then what we need is direction from city council. Right, okay, okay, all right. Thanks. So if you could just keep us informed in the staff reports as to that status. One more thing to add to your list. Um, okay. Comments from HPC commissioners. Anybody have anything else they'd like to add this evening? Commissioner Barnard. Yes. Um, first, I want to thank the city of Longmont for paying the registration for my uh, trip to La Junta for the Savings Places Conference. Saving Places Conference. Um, I just want to report to the to the uh, commissioners that it was a fantastic conference. Um, it was the equivalent of a full statewide conference. I had people from all over there that had great uh, panels, great presentations. And I, I've got to tell you that I thought I knew something about the state, but I really learned a lot about what just what the importance of the southeast section of Colorado was and why it was so critical being the joinder of two railroads and how the town grew and grew and grew and then it fell and fell and fell and fell and how the, the main message I got out of it was when the town was down they all got together and said how do we get back up again and the answer was historical historical uh, significance 
So they went around and they found all these historical significant things and they applied for grants and they got lots of money and they were able to build the town up and now it, you know, it's a, it's a lot of meetings there, a lot of people coming there. And so uh, it is, it's a valid, it was a validation of the work of historical preservation that it's not just something that we do and it's nice and you get labels and all that. It actually can have a significant impact on the development of your community. Great. Thank you. Any other comments? Seeing none. Uh, comments from City Council Representative. And thank you, Chair Lane. Uh, one thing that was not mentioned earlier in the meeting about some of the things that happened at City Council was that uh, a motion was passed that uh, the conservation overlay be brought back before City Council, and it was uh, conditioned on uh, HBC making a recommendation before it comes to City Council. Mm -hmm. So just to let you know, I'm sure that'll come to your agenda at some point, and we're waiting on your recommendation before we take up the issue again. Otherwise, uh, thank you all for the work you do. Thank you. With that, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We are adjourned. Thank you.